All right, everybody. All right, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Cool. So, um, first, in terms of uh, logistics, as uh, you might have seen, we increased the glass capacity to um, 225. So, about 70 more of you should have been able to get in. Um, we expect that still a couple of people will drop off. So, if you're still on the waiting list, uh, we'll pe keep people in from the waiting list. Um, if someone uh, drops the class. Um, also, there will be not, no class on Wednesday this week because I'll be in DC. Also, I moved my office hours to Mondays. So my office hours is Mondays from 10 to 12 now. So today I will be talking about um, some theory of visualization and then doing visualization with Matplotlib in Python. So first off, um, there's a really great book that uh, I recommend called, uh, oh. Great, are these not linked? Mm, this will not be great. Okay. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about Matplotlib and visualization, but uh, my computer doesn't like me today. That's great. Um, does this work? Nope. Sorry about that. Ha. Okay, so I think there's... Uh, two main reasons why we're using visualizations. Um, one of them is uh, communicating results to others, and one of them is basically looking at the data ourselves and um, uh, trying to understand what's going on with the data. For this class, uh, I think it's more important to uh, think about the data exploration aspect of ourself, ourselves trying to understand the data, but a lot of the things I'll talk about today also will reflect on uh, trying to use a visualization to talk about the data to someone else. And that's something that at least uh, everybody in DSI will need to do next semester in a capstone, but um, if any of you do any uh, data science in practice, you'll always have to communicate your results, and I think visualization is an important aspect of communicating results. Um, yeah, so if you're in DSI, um, I think you probably already had last semester a course on um, exploratory data analysis and visualization, so a couple of these things might be a repetition for you, um, but maybe they are good, but they're a summary or maybe there's a different emphasis, and also we'll be talking about how to do visualization with Python. So there's um, this great book by um, Klaus Wilke. Uh, that you can find online, or if you click on the slides, you can it will just uh, get you to the book. It's a pretty short uh, book, so it should be a relatively easy to read. It's about the theory of visualization and not so much um, like programming. I think it's written in R, but uh, it doesn't really talk about um, the programming aspects. But it's really good uh, as a summary of all the kinds of visualization techniques. And um, if you haven't already, you should definitely read it. Okay, yeah, so as I said the reasons for data uh, exploration, for data visualization are mostly to explore the data ourselves and to communicate it. And so before I uh, go into some particular styles of visualization, I want to talk about 
uh, some general principles. Um, so one of the founding founders of like statistical visualization is Edward uh, Tufte, and there's two things he said um, that I think uh, are quite interesting. One is above else, show the data, and maximize the data to ink ratio. What I think he meant with both of these is um, whatever you show should be aspects of the data. It shouldn't, or uh, majority aspects of the data. It shouldn't be like uh, tick marks, and it shouldn't be your interpretation necessarily of the data. It should first show the data and show the um, interesting aspects of the data. And try to uh, keep the visual noise, like all the things you could add to it, um, at a minimum. Um, another quote that I like is from uh, Cleveland, who wrote like one of the other or several of the other very influential books on data visualization, which is Tools Matter. And so. Um, I think it's important that we are very familiar with the tools that's true for anything in data science really and it's like core of one of, of this class is that you're familiar with how to build uh, different visualizations. Um, we'll be focusing on Matplotlib but I'll be uh, talking about a couple of the other libraries as well. And um, to finish up with the quotes, what I my, I think, most important statements about visualization is you should always label things and you should spend more time. And um, so I used to run the capstone course and so I saw a lot of the student reports in both here at NYU and um, this, they always made these two mistakes and if I review papers, they also make the same mistakes. Uh, not labeling axes, uh, not labeling what do the colors mean, what do the points mean, what does anything mean, without labels, it's kind of useless. And the other is uh, spend more time. So this is, this is for communication. So if you use a plot to communicate to someone else, um, really spend time uh, on creating the plot and thinking about what do you want to say with the plot. So if I show a plot on any of my slides, it usually takes me about an hour to make this plot. So if you put a, a plot in a report that took you less than five minutes to make, it's probably not as good as it could be. All right, so that was sort of some, some high level ideas. And um, I wanna talk very briefly, as I said, about some of the theory behind visualization. So one of the things is, um, it helps to think of the different visual channels we can use. Uh, here is a list. Uh, I linked the source of this as a PhD thesis that I linked in the materials. Um, you can also find this in Wilke's book. So um, you, ha you have things like uh, length, angle, curvature, shape, um, area, volume, different aspects of color like brightness, saturation, hue, texture. Um, and then position and like different grouping and um, things. And so these are like, you could actually come up with even more of them. But so um, these, if you look at any sign visualization, usually you can think of the visualization as mapping some aspect to the data to one of these things. So one aspect might be uh, mapped to angle or to area or to color or to uh, the X axis or the Y axis. Um, one thing that you should keep in mind is, um, in particular for quantitative data, so quantitative data meaning continuous data, there's a pretty clear hierarchy of these. And um, there's been several works that study how human perception works and what things work well. So position is um, the, like, by far the strongest cue. So, uh, comparing the position of things is much, much uh, easier than comparing anything else. The second is length, um, and third is angle, and fourth is area. And so, actually, this is already quite hard. If you think, like, uh, comparing the area of two things is much, much harder than comparing uh, the lengths of things. This is a reason why 
Um, generally, pie charts are often considered worse than just a bar chart because in the pie chart, it's well, it's using either angle or length. Uh, sorry, either angle or area. So often it's not, yeah. Um, and these are like harder to compare than length. Um, yeah, 3D is even harder. And um, actually color hue is at the, is at the very bottom of, of this uh, hierarchy. And color hue is actually something people love to use because it's very easy to use. And so, um, one of the important things is really don't use color U for quantitative data if you can avoid it. Um, I very often see in projects people uh, make, like, say, a map, and the map is color coded or um, for different frequencies. And um, so, this alone is very, very hard to read and very hard to compare frequencies in different areas. You can maybe see some hot spots. Um, and we'll talk about mapping from um, a continuous number to colors uh, later a little bit more. But like, there was one plot that someone showed me that was like, I think two maps of New York colored differently about uh, bike ridership. And they showed me that one is the women and the other one is the men. And they told me there's a um, particular ratio that you could see. But personally, so it's, if I have two images, I cannot compute the ratio of the hues in my mind. Uh, if I have the ratio of length, I can maybe sort of do that in my mind. But comp like doing any calculation on color hues is basically impossible. And so um, I would like if there's a critical aspect of the data, don't encode it as a color hue uh, for for quantitative data. Here is an illustration that I, th I think is nice from um, uh, Wilke's book, which shows how you can think of um, different aspects of the data mapping to uh, different of these channels. So this is like a fuel efficiency data set. And uh, so we're showing a five dimensional data set here. It's a very small data set, so we can show all of it, but it's five dimensional and actually all five dimensions are shown in the two dimensional plot. So displacement is mapped to the x-axis, fuel efficiency is mapped to the y-axis, um, horsepower is mapped to the uh, hue, weight is mapped to the size of the and um, of each point or marker, and cylinder is mapped to the shape of each marker. And so here, this is sort of, I think it's very interesting to see how you can combine all of these different axes. So. Combining all of these probably in practice will be a bad idea. So um, usually you will have much more data and will be much too crowded. Also, it's sort of hard to perceptually um, comprehend all of these at once. Uh, but I think it's nice to see about like which of these channels do I want to use and which um, axis do I map to which channel. So in, in this, um, in this graph, I could probably uh, equally um, use the displacement as the color and the power as the x-axis that would get a completely different chart. And so it's important to think about what are the things that you really want to visualize and which mapping to the different um, uh, aspects of the chart um, brings it out best. So talking a little bit more about uh, colors, uh, whenever you visualize a continuous variable, um, like using color or brightness or um, hue or saturation, you're using a color map that goes from a 1D uh, continuous value to a color. Here are some of the color maps in Matplotlib. And actually the choice of the color map is quite important. <clears throat> um, so if you have um, a qualitative variable, a categorical variable, you will want a qualitative color map, which is sort of 
uh, obvious that you want things that are like discrete units. But uh, if you want to have a continuous variable, there's all of these different choices. And um, historically, led by the amazing uh, MATLAB, MATLAB from Matworks, I think, people used this color map jet. And there's actually uh, quite some issues with using a color map like this that I want to go into. But so there's um, generally more or less three kinds of color maps. So there's those that are sequential, so that go from either from light to dark or from dark to light, and then also change in color. There's the diverging ones that have like a midpoint. So that's usually like zero or neutral or something like this. And then they go to uh, both negative and positive. And then you have these that are sort of uh, mixed high contrast color maps. And so um, even though these were used a lot, there's actually in a lot of areas quite, uh, quite an issue. So by default, I think Matplotlib and many other um, libraries now use the blue one here. It's called Verdes. There's also a couple other one, Inferno, Plasma, and Magna, Magma, that are uh, what's called perceptually uniform. And so I want to briefly talk about um, what that means. I think I also linked in the course material to a really great talk by Stefan van der Waals and um, Nathaniel Smith. Uh, they both worked in developing this, this um, color map. Usually they both work on NumPy. Um, so here are um, on the right hand side, you can see three images. And um, these are, oh, my mouse pointer is somewhere else. There's uh, yeah, three images. These are 2D images that um, uh, we map with a color map. Here in this case, it's the gray color map. The gray color map you can see here, um, it just goes from black to white and uh, basically with a uniform gradient. So the, the weighted lightness changes is uniform. So color maps are particularly important for um, heat maps like, uh, like this one here. So if, it's, if you have a two-dimensional um, array and you uh, visualize each, each pixel as a number, basically it's a heat map. And so here's a comparison of the, uh, on the left, the jet data, um, the jet color map that used to be used in Matplotlib and many other places. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, the various color map, which is the default since Matplotlib uh, 2.0. And so uh, what people notice is that with the color map on the left, with the jet color map, if you look at these two in particular, you can see that there looks to be like contours around the red and the yellow that are not actually there in the original data. So here this looks like just like a blob, whereas here it looks like there's a very clear ring and here you don't see that ring. Um, this sort of effect of having these discrete rings comes from the color map uh, having very uh, different changes in the gradient. So what you can see um, both here at the bottom is um, the colors um, mapped in a three-dimensional space that corresponds roughly to what uh, the human perceptual space, so how we perceive contrast between colors. And um, you can see that in this space, there's a bunch of kinks in how this one dimensional um, continuous number is mapped to the colors. And if you look at the gradient, this guy is the gradient of the color map. So basically, if you compute the, the gradient of this guy here in the space as it is perceived by humans, you get this. And this seems a pretty terrible way to map a 1D scalar, right, um, to, to anything. And uh, that is the reason why um, you get these ring effects. Um, when I first gave this lecture, a lot of people were still using these kind of color maps. Now people are less and less using these kind of color maps, but hopefully sort of um, I gave you an idea why. And so it's quite important that if you use a heat map that you use a, 
uh, something that's perceptually uniform, otherwise you might get these artifacts. And like, if you uh, look at a data set, uh, this plot and this plot might lead you to very different conclusions, and so just artifacts in the color map might lead to drawing conclusions um, that are not there. Oh yeah, and then, uh, another fun thing is if you print this, to black, or if you convert it to black and white, it's not invertible and it's completely, completely garbage. So it's like completely non-interpretable because it goes from dark to gray to a little bit lighter to a little bit darker. Anyway, so this were just some some um, uh, notes on general visualization principles and how to think about them. I want to uh, now transition to talk a little bit more about uh, Matplotlib. Um, and I'm talking about Matplotlib version two and three. Um, I hope no one is still using Matplotlib version one. If you're using Matplotlib version one, just don't. Ideally use version three. Um, so all the new styles and default, they changed a lot of things between one and two. So Definitely be using two and better use three. Um, so before I talk about Matplotlib, I want to talk about some of the libraries in Python. So Matplotlib is the one that's been around the longest and that has most of the, thi the most things built on top of it. So in particular, um, the plotting in Pandas is built on top of, of Matplotlib and it's quite convenient if you're plotting from data frames or generally it's pretty convenient. There's also Seaborn. Seaborn is built on top of Pandas and Matplotlib. So if you use any, any of these, um, the Pandas or the Seaborn one, it's very good to understand the fundamentals between, of Matplotlib because that's what it's built on. Seaborn has um, a lot of ready-made stats plots that can be quite useful, though I find for the kind of data that I have, they're sometimes a little bit cumbersome. Um, but yeah, your mileage may vary. But it definitely has much more ready-made plots like violin plots and like uh, facet plots and small multiple plots that are not easily built into, in, or they're like a little bit annoying to build in uh, my product directly. Um, and then there's a couple of alternatives. So probably I think by now the most commonly used one are Bokeh and Altair. Bokeh and Altair are basically from ground up um, complete rewrites of the visualization. And um, Altair in particular is declarative and basically you declare the data structure and you de declare in a data frame what axis you want to map to um, um, what, like, what aspect of the figure, so the x-axis or the color or the y-axis or the scale or so on. So it very much go, um, goes after this principle of um, mapping um, thing, like columns in the data to aspects of the uh, figure very directly. And so that's kind of cool. Um, it's still a little bit new and I'm not like, and, but it's getting more and more complete. Um, Bokeh is also from the ground up rewritten. I think both Bokeh and Altair uh, might only work in Jupyter. Um, so you can't, uh, I'm not sure if you can use them I'll even probably use them in standalone scripts, but I'm actually not entirely sure how, how well they work in standalone scripts. They're mostly meant for uh, in browser. Yeah, so Bokeh is another um, uh, library uh, rewritten with JavaScript support. Both of Altair and Bokeh are pretty good if you want interactive visualization in the browser. If you're coming from R, there are several ggplot translations and interfaces and transcriptions. So you can check, I think plot nine is maybe the most current one, but there's like always new ones coming out. And they're always missing something, so someone else comes up with a different one. Um, there's a BQ plot from um, Bloomberg that's quite good for doing inter uh, interactive exploration of um, time series. So this is also f uh, like JavaScript based in browser. So you can use it from Python, but it's written in JavaScript. 
and yeah, it has a focus on time series, as you might expect uh, for a financial institution or financial uh, company. Um, finally, there's uh, yellow brick, which is also written on Matplotlib. Yellow brick is for, uh, for plotting particular aspects of scikit-learn. So it tries to do some um, things for easier, easier model, model visualization and metric visualization. Right now, we're working on putting more visualization directly into scikit-learn, and so um, um, maybe we all sort of absorb the stuff in yellow brick. But uh, for now, you can either use the stuff in scikit-learn that we're just creating, or you can use yellow brick, or you can roll your own using any of these. Uh, for the first homework, I require you to use matplotlib. For all the later homework, um, you can basically use anything you want. Um, though you're not, I, I'll, I'll say this again in the homework, but I don't think there will be any homework where you're allowed to use um, Dabble, which is uh, my new library because it does everything automatically. And I want you to understand what's happening. Yeah, so I mean, I'm basically using uh, matplotlib based plotting, but if you feel, prefer um, Bokeh or Altair, oh, Plotly is also an option. Plotly uh, is uh, done by a company. I'm, I'm not sure how, mu how much of the library they're completely open sourced by now, but um, there are some aspects that are, that are proprietary, uh, but a lot of people like it. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about matplotlib. Um, First off, imports. Please don't import star even in a notebook, uh, particularly because a lot of the uh, fundamental libraries might have similar um, functions, like histogram. If you call histo if you do this and you call histogram, uh, what's it, what is it going to do? Um, it's kind of hard to know. So please always import these things um, as like a module. Second thing, so I don't think you have to actually do this in the no most common Jupyter lab anymore. Oh, maybe. So he here knows the difference between Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab. No one, okay, who here has used Jupyter Lab? Okay. Who here has used Jupyter Notebooks? Oh, okay, I'm gonna get, tell them that I need to work on their marketing. Uh, no, so Jupyter Lab is the next generation of Jupyter Notebook, basically. So where you have at the side you have like um, a file browser, and you can open like multiple windows at once, and you can split them, and it's m much more like an IDE. Um, and so I guess they wanted yeah, to have some of the nice aspects of IDEs, like what you get maybe in RStudio or in MATLAB, and like um, be a little bit more like that. Jupyter Lab is great. Try it out. Um, but I'm not really going to talk about it anymore. So if you w want to plot um, in uh, Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook, uh, you used to have to declare that you want to do Matplotlib inline, but I think now they do this by default. What this does is basically it um, renders a PNG, so you just render an image, you, and you send that image to the browser. That's very robust, and it just kind of works but it means you don't have panning or zooming, and it also means every time you do a call, you get a new figure, and you can't change a figure that you created earlier because it was just a PNG sent to the browser. And so that's sort of nice and easy, but it's like pretty static. Um, if you're in Jupyter Notebook, you uh, can do Matplotlib Notebook. That gives you interactivity, so then you can do pan and zoom. Oh yeah, this is a, a notebook magic. So this is a Jupyter specific command that starts with this percent. So if you do uh, everything that starts with a percent is a command that goes directly to Jupyter. And so this tells you you want the notebook um, uh, interface with your method of notebook. Um, this is JavaScript based and doesn't work in Jupyter Lab. Um, but it works in your Jupyter notebook and so this allows you to update existing figures and it update uh, and um, it allows you to have like interactivity and you can do pan and zoom. Um, by default, matplotlib doesn't have any brushing, um, which many of the other libraries do. 
And finally, if you're using Jupyter Lab, which you absolutely should, and you want interactive visualizations, you have to run methodlib widget, but you have to install a plugin. So in Jupyter Lab notebooks, um, basically the notebook could in, uh, include arbitrary JavaScript and would just run it. Uh, that's a pretty big security risk. And so they stopped doing that in Jupyter Lab. And so in Jupyter Lab, basically, method, so they can't just push the JavaScript anymore. So you have to install a separate package that contains the JavaScript for the interactivity. All right. So now we finally have set up our, imported and set up our matplotlib. Uh, very briefly, some uh, terminology. So, um, the two main objects that you're working with are figure and axis. The figure is usually uh, like one window if you pop it up or one image file or one interactive uh, thing in the browser that has its own like uh, GUI. And um, an axis is a drawing area that has its own coordinate system. By default, if you call plot, what will happen is it'll create one figure and the figure will have a single axis and you'll plot into this axis. Um, but very often it's nice to create multiple axes within the same figures if you want to do mo small multiple plots or something like this. So here you have a two, um, two axes within a single figure. So there's a couple ways to um, create figures and axes. So the first way uh, is you just don't worry about it. If you call any plot command, it will create a figure and an axis for you and it will create plot into this uh, figure and axis. Um, you can do plt.figure, it will create a figure and it will have a single axis, but you can add fig uh, other um, axis later. Or my favorite uh, way to create axis is plt.subplots that allows you to get get a regular grid of n times m uh, of subplots. So this is sort of what you get here. Here I have like a, called subplots two comma two. So I get a two by two grid uh, and then I can plot into each of these uh, things individually. Um, so if you um, if you really like MATLAB, um, there's one way to, cre to create a similar thing, uh, which is just call plt.subplot and mi, where n and m is the shape of the grid, and it will add something to uh, the i, uh, and, and you will get the i element of this grid back. This is kind of a weird inter uh, interface, so here at the bottom I wrote like, if you do two, two, one, you get the top left. If you do two, 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 you get the top right, and so on. And it's indexed by one because it's stolen from MATLAB. Um, so I prefer doing something like plt.subplots two, two, and I get the figures and the axis back and I have an array of axes. Um, the benefit of doing this um, one axis at a time is that you can be a little bit more creative and you can add um, axes of different shapes. So here, for example, for the first two plots, I pretend I have a two by two grid and for the last one, I pretend I have a two by one grid and so I can have like a row spanning axis and I can do cool plots with that. The main reason for like having these two slightly different interfaces for subplots though I think is that there's generally two interfaces to all of matplotlib basically. Um, one is a stateful interface and the other one is an object oriented interface. So in the stateful interface, there's a current axis and a current figure. And if you ca call any plot object, it will plot into whatever is the current object. So there's a global state which is like, if you're a computer science person, like it makes you slightly nauseous. Um, and so basically the user has to remember what is the current global state and uh, this is what I'm gonna plot in. This is if you call plt.something, uh, this is the interface you're using. 
if you call plt.subplot, it'll set the current um, uh, the current axis. So it will create an axis and set the current axis. So, for example, I can say, oh, I'm going to create the subplot in a 2x2 two two grid at position 1, and then I'm going to plot into it, and I'm going to create it at the position 2, and I'm going to plot into it, and this time in red. And so this is the two plots that you can see. Um, so this is a stateful interface, where basically, um, there, somewhere in the depth of Matplotlib, it is hidden which one is the current axis. The interface that is much more explicit is the object-oriented interface, where basically we have axis objects, and on the axis objects, so actually this axis here is a two by two NumPy array of axis objects, and I can index into it, and then I can get out the single axis, and I call the plot command on the axis. So here there is no hidden state, and I say explicitly, what is the axis I want to plot on? Um, so these two codes are equivalent ways, um, only they use like very different interfaces in a sense. So sometimes when I do quick and dirty stuff, I use like, if I want to do a single figure basically, usually I use the first one. If I want to do more than one figure, I usually use the second one. But generally using the second one is uh, sort of much cleaner, where you explicitly handle with which axis object you're working with. And uh, I think the difference between these two interfaces is sort of a main pain point in using Matplotlib. And so it's good if you sort of think about that a little bit and make sure you understand it. Um, so because if this would be the only difference that would be too easy, so all the plot commands, like plot and scatter and hist uh, histogram and uh, I don't know, bar, all of them have the same name in both of these interfaces. So you can do plt.plot or x.plot. So you can do plt.bar or x.bar. But anything that modifies the axis has different names. Um, so plt.title is the same as axis.setTitle, plt.xlim is the same as x.setXlim, and so on. And some of the things are only available in the object-oriented interface. For example, setting the ticks and the labels uh, differently. And there's some other things um, that you can do only in your interface. But so, depending on whether you use the stateful interface or the object-oriented interface, you have to prepend the set underscore or not, which is definitely not confusing. Oh yeah, and if you wrote, let's say, if you wrote something, but then in the end, you figure out, oh, I actually, I want to um, change something on the, on the axis I created earlier, or the, um, you can always get the global state objects with plt.gca to get current axis or plt.gcf to get current figure. This will give you the objects that are the current objects. And so that's also often useful. Um, I briefly want to talk about some of the most common plot commands and some of the nice things and tricks about them. Um, there, Matplotlib has a gallery that you can find at the top, and there's also a great summary which has all of the high-level plotting commands. Um, the first one is uh, plot. So plot you can use for line plots and for scatter plots, basically. So by default, it does a line plot. Um, if you don't provide a y-axis, the y it will just enumerate. And so here I just gave the axis. Sorry. If you don't give it an x-axis, sorry. If you don't give, if you give it a single array. It, it assumes the array is uh, the y-axis. So if I give it just a sinus curve, it goes basically, um, it enumerates the values. So there's 100 values and it goes from one to 100. I can also explicitly uh, give the, um, uh, both the x and the y-axis. So if I give x, if I give two arrays, it's the x-axis and the y-axis. 
and then I can also like change them. If I want to do a scatter plot, you can change the markers. So by default, it's a line plot. If I set the marker instead of dash, which is the default, dash means a line plot. If I set it to O, I get a, a scatter plot. If I set it to dot, I get smaller scatters. If I set it to X, I get a scatter plot with axes and so on. Of course, you can set things like color, transparency, and so on. If you want, like, if you want to do a line plot with dashes, you can set to dash dash. Um, if you want dash and dots, you can do dash dash O and so on. So there's many different line styles. Um, one thing that I'm a little bit angry about is that, so in PLT that subplots, you can um, specify the figure size, which is often good, because if you don't specify the figure size, the figure will have some default shape and it's usually bad. Um, so the, fig the if you see the subplot is called two comma four, which means there's two rows and four columns. So it's y comma x, but then the figure size is x comma y. And then I get angry. Um, cool. So uh, another command that's um, very useful is scatter. So sc if you, so scatter can do scatter plot, plot, plot can also do uh, plots, scatter plots. So here, the first one is just calling plot with O. The second one is calling scatter with X and Y. They're the same. Um, but what scatter can also do is um, you can change the color. So if you either want to do a continuous variable or if you want to um, uh, plot uh, categorical variables like color by class size, you can, or by, sorry, by class, um, identity, um, you can set C. In this case, I set C to be the difference from the diagonal and I use the contrasting color map. So everything that's on X equal to Y is white. Everything ab above is blue and everything below is red. Um, so scatter can also set the color individually for each point and can also set the size individually for each point. If you don't want to do that, then plot and scatter do the same thing. New in Matplotlib 3, I think, for some reason, um, is you can also have legends for scatter plots. Um, but it's like a little bit, a little bit annoying. Um, histograms, also great. Um, by default, histograms have 10 bins. That's never the right number of bins. So you can um, change the number of bins manually or there's auto. Uh, you, get, you have the same auto keyword if you use the histogram from pandas. The histogram from pandas just calls this, which calls the NumPy histogram, and NumPy has the auto option. So there are several different uh, heuristics uh, for finding the bins, but basically it usually looks much more reasonable. You can probably like do more fine tuning or do statistic, more statistical analysis, but basically there's not really any reason to use 10 and auto is probably gonna be better. Um, okay. Uh, bar charts. I don't know if there's anything interesting. So bar charts actually, I think, are a little bit easier to do if you use pandas directly than with um, uh, matplotlib. And matplotlib, you have to give it both the, uh, in this case, the x coordinate and the height. So I give it the range and then the number. Uh, for uh, horizontal bar charts, again, you have to give it the y and then the width, which is like, yeah, annoying, and so uh, pandas would make these for you automatically. Um, so generally, if you have very long categories, okay, so look at, so these two charts are the same. Who finds the one on the left easier to read? Who finds the one on the right easier to read? Okay. So I also find text much easier to read if it goes from left to right and it goes from bottom to top. 
Even if I make it from top, is it from the bottom to top or? Yeah. Even if you make it from top to bottom, that would maybe be a little bit better. But I think left to right is really, at least for, you know, people that are mostly used to like English, uh, it's easier to read. Um, and so if you do horizontal bar charts, you can make the ticks in a, in a reasonable orientation. Very important trick. Um, so whenever I have many categories, uh, or like n long category names, I would always use a horizontal bar chart just so I can read the tick labels without doing this guy. Um, Yeah, heat maps. I mean, so as I said, for heat maps, one of the inter oh, there's two things that are actually interesting. One is um, interpolation. The other one is thinking about um, the color maps. So I already talked about the color maps a little bit. So at the top left is the default behavior, at least in the new new in the version two and three. Um, so you can interpolate color. Uh, Maps, sorry, so you can play heat maps. That's on the top right. Um, people like sometimes like to do this because it looks nicer. But you, what you're doing is inv you're invent data mostly. So um, don't interpolate plots unless there's a good reason to. So they used to do this by default. Now they don't. But like if the if your this is actually your data and your data is this then I don't think there's a reason to show this instead. Um, if your data came about by some aggregation or something that m makes smoothing sensible, I don't know, maybe, but definitely something to think about. And then, um, so the choice of the color map um, also matters. So for example, both in, the, in this default one and, and in this one, it's very hard to, um, figure out the value of the background. So I can see that where it's bright and where it's dark, but I don't know, is the, I might be interested, is the gray positive or negative or zero? And I can't really say, is the gray positive or negative or zero? And I can't say it in the top one either. So here, like, this is a good example for a uh, diverging color map, where I can see where is the zero level and what's positive and what's negative. Oh, another thing that's interesting uh, when using color maps is um, specifying v min and v max. These are the maximum values for the color map. So otherwise, the color map gets scaled by whatever data is available. But if you know sort of what are the reasonable minimum maximum values, then maybe you can see more detail or you can look at different aspects of the data by um, setting different v min and v max. All right, so coming to my favorite issue, um, overplotting. So usually when you do machine learning, you're happy if you have big data sets. That's slightly different to sort of more classical data visualization. Most like data visualization that is like 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, they didn't have a lot of data. Um, so they didn't really think about overplotting too much. So uh, here I have this plot, and um, so the, sort of the, on the left-hand side, you can basically see very little about the structure of the data. And so the easiest hack that a lot of people use is to change the alpha. Um, so if you change the transparency, you can maybe see more structure of the data. Um, one issue here is that it's actually, I mean, there's not necessarily a right alpha value. So here I created the data so that basically all of the mass is in the center. And depending on um, what the alpha value is that you chose, you can see this or you can not see this. Or you might not see other aspects of the data. Um, anyone have an idea what another way would be to overcome the overplotting issue? I mean, one way is to add a little bit of noise, but that mostly actually works for things that are ordinal. Here, this big stripe in the center, there's just like, 
if you, you're just going to make the stripe wider if you add noise, right? So that's not going to help. If there are enough points, you can just plot random points uh, as long as the distribution looks fairly similar. Okay, yeah, you can plot random points. That's also a good hack, not what I thought about, uh, but um, that's definitely also a solution. Um, so what my favorite thing is ha uh, hex grids. Um, what hex grids do are basically a 2D uh, binning. And so what you're doing is you compute a density map. So it's called hex grids because you're binning not on a rectangular grid, but you have like um, hexagons and they're like in the a honeycomb um, structure. You could also do this on like a regular 2D grid, but the main idea is that you're just visualizing density directly. So here now, um, if I visualize density directly, I can more readily um, map the density to a color map. Again, I said earlier, well, mapping a number to a color map is maybe like not the best idea, but um, it's still uh, better than dealing with the overplotting. And so here you can see I actually um, set the bins to log. So basically I um, um, did this, uh, bit, this 2D histogram on a honeycomb pattern, and then I took the log of the density is, and then I plotted that. And so what you can do, what you can see here, basically means that the center point has about um, 10 to the four many points, and everything else has like 10 points at most. Um, so like all the data is in the center. And it's actually very common that sort of, if you look at a plot, it looks like the data is everywhere, but Actually, most of the data is very concentrated in a couple of few points. And so um, I think this is actually quite a nice uh, technique to, to work with bigger data sets. Oh, there's another one that I should have put on the slides but didn't. Um, there's a software called uh, Data Shader for Bokeh, but there's also a Matplotlib version. Um, I'll post a link to it, uh, which basically um, uses every single pixel as a different bin, and it's also kind of cool. But yeah, so this is sort of going from um, uh, scatter plots to density plots is one way to overcome overplotting. There's actually like a whole big um, literature on how to do this uh, in the plotting literature, but um, I don't think there's like a real consensus. There's, yeah. I mean, subsampling is definitely also an option, and then there's like splatter plots and some other things. Um, but I think if you um, like basically changing alpha is like maybe nice as a first approximation. It's usually what I do as as like a first tag. But then looking at density plots um, can give you more resolution. All right. So the next thing that I want to mention is uh, twin axes. So here, in this plot, I'm comparing two things. Um, so I have two series. One of them is the number of math PhDs awarded uh, for each year from 2000 to 2009. And the other series is the uh, revenue that was made by arcades in that year. And so, uh, let's assume I think they have something to do with each, each other. If I just plot them sort of naively using plot, they will both share the same y-axis. And so, um, wait, can I do powers of 10? This is billion, right? It says something like, uh, it, yeah, they made like $1 billion or something in 2000. And so that's obviously way, way higher than the number of math PhDs. So the math PhD line just looks like flat zero. Um, the uh, way to fix this is to um, add a new um, x axis that has, 
or sorry, add a, use twin x. Twin x uses a twin of the x axis, but adds a separate y axis. And so now I have um, a separate y axis for the revenue by arcades and one for the number of mass PhDs. And you can see the mass PhDs are um, like in the thousands and the revenue made by arcades is still in the uh, like around 1 billion. And we can see that they are highly correlated. Uh, and it's definitely like, I think it's uh, uh, P with like, the P value is like three zeros at least. Um, but I mean, they're, they're causally unrelated, but uh, they're statistically um, correlated. So yeah, this is something, if you want to compare different series uh, using twin X or twin Y, if you want to do it in the other direction, is uh, very useful. Um, a couple of other things, more in terms of uh, guidelines of, for creating the plots, you should think about. Um, one is um, aspect uh, ratios. So there's actually this cool blog called eagereyes.org. They have a couple of cool things about um, visualizations. So there was a thing in the um, vision li literature, I think it was like maybe in the 90s, where basically it said, well, we should, what is, so the question is, what is the perfect aspect ratio? So these three uh, plots show uh, the, the same data, but you could interpret them as uh, telling three different stories. So the, um, in the first one, or let's say in the second one at least, the June spike is like very pronounced and looks like, oh, something happened in June. Whereas in the third one, you would never say, oh, something happened in June. Um, and so um, interpretation clearly just changes with just how you scale your axes. Matplotlib has a default and it just uses the default. And there's no reason why this default should be the right thing to do. Um, there's a thing called banking to 45 degrees and um, basically, it, the idea behind it is computing all the slopes and then change the aspect ratio so that the mode of the slopes is 45 degrees. And there was like a, 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 a user study actually done saying this helped, but then it didn't replicate. So this is still something people do, even though the, like, the science didn't really like confirm. Um, that it might still be like an interesting thing. I'm not sure if there's something in Python to do this right now, but, um, and I'm also not sure if it's like the right thing, but um, it's definitely something to pay attention to when you're creating your plots. Um, similarly, baselines are quite important. So here, again, the same data plotted in two different ways and um, Again, the message can be very different depending on what your baseline is. Um, so people often feel like baseline zero plots are sort of the honest one, um, but it depends. Um, and so for each of these choices, whatever plotting library you use will have a default value and it will do this thing for you. But there's, again, there's no reason the default value should be the right thing for whatever your visualization is. And so it's basically just something, a choice that you need to make, but you just should be consciously making this choice and not just doing whatever the library did for you. All right. So you can also plot in 3D with Matplotlib, but um, so if you, if you want to plot with 3D, you can import from MPL toolkits MPL 3D import x is equal to 3D. You just need to import it. You don't do anything with it. And then if you create an axis, you need to see pro projection equal to 3D. If you have an interactive axis, um, you can just you can spin it around and pan and zoom and everything. If you do the um, PNG front end, obviously you don't have any interactivity. Uh, and then you could, for example, um, you can specify a viewpoint in a projection if you want. So here, this is, I think this is like a Lawrence attractor or something. Oh yeah, it says so. Um, that looks really cool just doing um, a line plot. Um, generally, I find 3D things uh, 
not as useful in particular. I mean, if you don't have deinteractivity, they're just pretty useless because, uh, so if you do, for example, a 3D scatter plot without interactivity, it's just a 2D scatter plot with a weird projection that the UI chose for you, right? Um, if you have the interactivity, you can spin it around and you can see different angles, but um, at least sort of for, um, it might be good for uh, exploration. Honestly, I don't do it that much because um, usually you don't have only three axes, you have like 50 axes, and if you have 50 axes, then whether you can show two or three at a time, maybe it doesn't make that big of a difference. Um, but yeah, you can do like all kinds of different 3D things. Please don't 3D, use 3D if you don't have to. Um, so this is, I don't know if you can see, so this is a volumetric display. Um, try to avoid volumetric displays. Like here in this case, this is just, um, I think four by four histograms. Oh, does anyone have a better idea of how to visualize this? You can do st stacked bar graph. You can also just do four bar graphs. Or you could do a heat map. Like this is just a heat map, right? This is a really weird way to show a heat map. Um, and if you don't like colors, just show all the bar bars because this is like only 16. Um, I can easily look at 16 bars. I have no idea what's going on in this. Huh. Okay, looks like I talked a little bit too fast today because um, I'm already uh, sort of uh, coming to an end. So there's a couple of things that um, I really want to emphasize in creating visualizations. Um, so the first thing is really take your time and think about, I talked about different, a lot of different aspects of visualizations, like how do I map from um, the, like a coordinate to like a visual concept? Then how do I pick a baseline? How do I pick a color map? How do I pick an aspect ratio? And all of these are decisions you need to make and um, you need to think about, or should make consciously. And, so, and that just takes time. Again, as I said in the beginning, um, just label everything and um, yeah there there's no excuse not to label everything and um, another thing that I haven't mentioned so far but it's also really really critically important is think about um, questions and stories for your plots in particular if you're communicating generally each plot should answer a question. And so maybe the question is just like, oh, I assume the data is Gaussian, is it Gaussian? And then you look at the plot and say, oh, it's Gaussian, or oh, it's not Gaussian. But you had like um, maybe a hypothesis that you wanted to look, whatever patterns that you wanted to look for, that you either wanted to confirm or not confirm. Um, again, so often I read like uh, student reports that say, Here's a bar plot of column Y. Here, here's a histogram of the age. Okay, but why? Why are you showing this to me? Um, so this is true both in when you do exploratory analysis for yourself, but it's even more so true if, when, if you're communicating. And again, like wherever you're doing data science, you will have to communicate it. And if you show someone something and say, here's a histogram of this variable, this is like, there's no really po point in doing this. Um, you should always say like, why are you showing this? And what is the conclusion you draw from it? Do you see, oh, there's mostly young people in here or the distribution of ages is the distribution over the whole population as we would expect. Or there's a weird outlier I can't explain, which is also a good thing to say. A good reason to show a graph is there's a weird outlier I can't explain. But if you just show me the data, and don't tell me why you show me the data. I'm going to be very confused. Um, yeah, so think about what is the um, question the graph is supposed to answer. 
And then I, if you're communicating things, write down the question or write down what is the answer. Often you just can write down the answer. Um, yeah, a couple of don'ts. So I, I don't really like to use 3D unless it's really necessary, in particular communicating, because usually you're communicating in 2D. If you're communicating something on a website and you can give an animation, maybe that's okay. But if you have to, if something needs to be printed in a paper, there's usually no point in doing 3D. Uh, I wouldn't use pie charts usually. Um, and um, one thing that comes from the quote from um, Tufta that I started with is, you don't have non-varying ink, which means don't have things that show stuff that are not the data. Like don't have like, big shadows everywhere or something that is not really actually um, showing any aspect of the data. And finally, no matter which of the um, uh, software packages you're using, uh, try to refrain from editing any figure manually. The problem is if you add a, add a figure manually, there's no way to reproduce it. Ideally, you want to be able to give someone code or a notebook to say, this is how I made the figure. This is true whether you're in a business or in a science setting. You, like, if you write a paper and you make it a figure and someone says, how do you make the figure? You don't want to tell them, I ran this Python script and then I outputted the, uh, then I opened the output in Photoshop. Th th this, is, this is really bad, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of people do that, but there's a very easy way to avoid the temptation. Just never, ever, ever edit a figure manually. Um, and maybe it takes you a little bit more to get it exactly right with the right plotting tools, but just make it reproducible by not editing it manually. Um, so there's a couple of books. Um, I already mentioned some of them. So very classical are Visual Display of Qu um, Quantitative Information uh, by uh, Edward Tufte. That's sort of one of the foundations of the field. There's Visualizing Data by Cleveland. Um, so these are both like somewhat pre-digital um, so they, like, I think Cleveland at some point talks about like, now that we can actually show stuff on screens, we can do this and this. Um, Fundamentals of Data is very recent, um, maybe came out last year or so, and it's very readable, very short. And if you, and for like stuff around Python, uh, dealing with Pandas, NumPy, um, Matplotlib, Jupyter, um, Jake Van Fossil's Python Data Science Handbook uh, is great. And the last two are both like available online for